Hello, thank you so much for allowing me to present at this symposium. Um, this is a study on uh, pre-service music teachers' creative identities, and um, I measured them with a colleague in Singapore, Leonard Tan, and so he's not presenting with me today, but um, certainly he was a huge part of this work. So, um, And so we'll jump right in. Um, it's a quantitative study, so it follows up fairly traditional design. Uh, so I've got an introduction and background, literature method, some results, implications, and I, I'm hoping to have uh, a lot of time for examples from practice. So, so creative identity is something that I've been looking at for about 10 years, a, a little more than that. Um, and so I borrow, um, I, I gain a lot of insight from the identity literature. And so who a teacher is and will become is in many ways a product of their occupational identity. So their outlook on um, who they are and who they can become um, is, makes up their occupational identity. And teachers' identities, importantly, guide their thoughts and actions and inform all of what they will do and become as teachers. And so creative identity, then, is something that flows um, you know, uh, from those ideas. Uh, who a teacher is creatively and will become in many ways is a product of their occupational identity. And so um, those of us who are interested in change, it becomes very important that those elements of change and those areas of musicianship are also a part of um, who they think that they could become in the future. So teachers' creative identities guide their thoughts and actions and inform all of what they will do as a teacher when creativity is concerned. So um, it goes without saying, but I'll say it, nurturing creative identity is essential then. Um, teachers' identities regarding their creative musicianship will guide their thoughts and actions and inform all of what they will do as a teacher who values nurturing creative identity in their students. So it's a cyclical th um, thing that sort of builds. Um, a teacher identifies themselves as being creative. They practice those um, elements of musicianship in their lives, and then uh, their students see them uh, in action, and their students see that as something that's valuable in the setting of school music education. So some literature. Um, I borrowed a lot, um, get, got a lot of inspiration from the um, dissertation of Dan Isbell in 2008. Um, I met him uh, in 2007 and uh, became really interested in his work. And, and he, was, he gave me, actually before his dissertation um, was finished, he gave me the, the measure that he used to measure socialization and occupational identity. And I actually used that um, adjusted the items accordingly, and that's where the development of this particular measure in this study um, came from. So Tammy Drave's work on identity is also very important. Um, she found that identity is a fluid construct, so um, not set in stone, um, but um, able to be molded. And uh, uh, similarly, uh, Ballantyne and colleagues found that pre-service music teachers' identities are dynamic and that uh, programs... Uh, Programs are essential to nurturing their development, and so um, we can we can make change. We can we can um, influence how pre-service music teachers' um, identities are are transformed um, over our time with them and beyond. So um, we know that from a lot of our music ed researchers, scholars, um, and theorists that uh, we're we're. It, living during a period of rapid change. Um, Michael Mark, um, the late Michael Mark, wrote in 2015 that music education history informs our future. And um, we're always sort of on more solid ground when we satisfy the prevailing needs of society. It's a good thing for us to espouse to. And Matt Tebow um, wrote in 2015 that there's a, a shifting locus of music education from performance to recording, um, which became really significant, really interesting during this period of COVID-19. So um, we're, we're looking at thinking about the profession differently, thinking about it, turning it sort of to its side and turning it over and looking at it um, and seeing that, um, you know, we could be doing things much differently. Um, so similarly, Matt, uh, Evan Tobias uh, wrote in 2015 that there's a new and emerging media that's um, pretty incredible and unpredictable in, in some ways and um, you know we can develop uh, media skills and media fluency and uh, media competency in music education and that could be a huge part of what we do and what we offer in schools so um, I've ha had a, a string of studies that look at creative identity um, 
uh, and from a different, a, a number of different cross-cultural perspectives. The first in 2012 with Gareth Dillon Smith and looking at British and U.S. pre-series music teachers' identities, um, and then uh, Sari Muhanen in Finland, and then um, Julie Ballantyne in Australia. So um, you can look at those studies, look them up, um, and basically over that time, I, I've developed this measure that um, uh, I've been able to find is pretty reliable and valid, at least for the constructs that I'm the most interested in, and more about that here in the method section. But this conceptual model then uh, flowed from uh, an idea of how uh, how the ways that I've looked at creative identity is actually manifest in practice. So new music ensembles, composition, improvisation, popular music are all part of... Um, this uh, perspective of what I, how I've conceived of creative identity. Of course, you could conceive of it very differently, and maybe, maybe you should. Maybe you should uh, take the the measure and adjust it and add certain things. It's never meant to be. Uh, it's meant to be flexible and fluid in the development. Much like I took the design from Dan Isbell's dissertation, looking at identity and primarily performance identity. So. Um, we're interested in these things, so we should be able to come up with a lot of different measures and ways of looking at the things that we value. So method specifically, um, the creative identity measure is a 20-item questionnaire, um, and it followed uh, it follows the development trajectory of, of the previous studies, from the Eng uh, English study to the Finnish to the Australian and now um, Singapore population. Um, 174 surveys were returned out of 698 in the U.S., so a 25% acceptance rate, and 100 surveys were returned from Singapore. And the items address, um, as I've said before, composition, teachers' perceptions of their own creativity is re regarding composition, improvisation, new music ensembles, and popular music. And uh, the measure was developed to get at self-perceptions of personal musical creativity as well as beliefs about the value of musical creativity areas in, uh, in the curriculum in practice. So all of these are, are, um, are accounted for in the conceptual model, which shows that um, these various role identities occur at various strengths over the career um, of, a, of a teacher. And so pre-service music teachers being like sort of one cross-section of the, of the life uh, of a, of a music teacher. So the items specifically um, asked the, the participants to rate the importance of composing original music, imp improvising on your primary instrument or voice, being involved with new music ensembles. So these things that, that, are, that could be found in the conceptual model, all those pieces then, um, the items were worded in accordance to the way that Dan Isbell used them in his dissertation, which was found, it's published in Journal Research and Music Ed, it's found to be reliable and valid. So, um, you know, looking at what I thought creative identity was at the time, um, I created that measure. So uh, the second part of it, there's two parts to the, the measure. The second part, um, participants are ex asked to indicate the extent to which they agree or disagree with the following statements. I can compose my own music. Um, I, would, I could give students feedback on their creative work. I will present popular music performance listening into my role as a music teacher. So um, these were all um, done in accordance to other psychological measures that have been found to be reliable and valid. So, um, so table one shows descriptive statistics um, um, and some analysis of variance of the, diff the specific items. And so you can see means of Singapore and U.S. populations and uh, de a degree of significance off to the right. So composing original music... Um, uh, improvising on your own, on your primary instrument of voice, being involved in new music ensembles are all significant at the uh, 0.0001 level. Um, and so favoring uh, the Singapore population and, um, and more about practice a bit later. But also number nine, presenting popular music to students as a vehicle for student expression in school music programs is also significantly different uh, in favor of the Singapore population. Um, so on the second part of the of the questionnaire um, of the measure, um, we've got a degree, a level of significance um, at the same level for I could give students feedback on their creative work, um, and um, that's it on that one. So analysis um, then 
to, to determine uh, where the two populations were different, we utilized ANOVA um, yeah, at that uh, sp specific level. And then exploratory factor analysis was used um, to look for latent variables in the measure. So looking at all of the items then um, where we identified some subscales. And so the subscales then were treated as um, um, components of the measure that we could look at for comparisons. So latent variables of the two populations were compared with uh, accordance uh, using Man uh, MANOVA um, at that level of significance. So the results uh, of exploratory factor analysis, um, the factors loaded like this, and so you can see creative, the subscales were named then, um, you know, creatively, uh, you know, much like a qualitative researcher looks for themes, uh, quantitative researchers using exploratory factor analysis have to name the subscales. So creative music making self-efficacy or the degree to which uh, participants thought they could be successful in the future doing those um, creative activities that are a part of the measure. The v uh, value of creative musicianship areas, willingness to allow for creativity in the classroom, and value of popular music listening performing in the classroom. So those were all a part. And here's the here are the subscales um, according to item. So um, you can kind of see, you could go back to that first, uh, the charts on descriptive statistics and see how I created those subscales. Um, and, and see if you agree with the logic behind uh, the naming of the subscales. So, um, so looking uh, um, looking at multiple analysis variants at the subscales and the scale at, at large, um, there was a significant difference between the U.S. and Singapore um, as, as far as the measure as a whole. And um, also, um, according to subscale number two and subscale number four, not one and three. So two and four were value of the creative musicianship areas and the value of popular music listening and performing. And so there was not a difference um, as far as willingness to allow for creativity in the classroom or value of creative music making self-efficacy. So, um, so. Uh, or, or cre creative music making self-efficacy subscale one. So um, that's interesting, and, and um, th it was slightly different than the populations in England, Finland, Aust and in Australia. So, um, and the differences are, I mean, I think that the a good use of this measure is sort of a place to start a discussion about curriculum. Um, how are they different? And let's look at what's happening in these curriculum. Uh, the, in the curricula in both places, and, and then how can we change that in, in looking at how we um, how we educate pre-service music teachers? So, uh, in the end, here nurturing creative, creative identity is essential, and teachers' identities regarding the, their creative musicianship will guide their thoughts and actions and inform all of what they will do as a teacher who values nurturing creative identity in their students. So we have to make a place for it in our pre-service music teacher education. Um, the curriculum in Singapore is slightly different. It, there is um, a more visible uh, popular music, creative musicianship core um, to the education of all music teachers in Singapore. And so I look at that and I look at our programs in the United States. I think that we can learn from uh, those programs in Singapore and I think that we can do better. I think that we should do better. Um, and I have some ideas um, for how to do that from practice that I'm going to show you now. And so you can see uh, in this example that, that um, during COVID-19 we, we learned how to record things. We, we had we, we created a priority for recording, recording arts. And so in my own musicianship, I was making videos for the, the church that I, uh, I, I'm a musician in. And uh, also my students were making, uh, were recording themselves, um, practicing their creative musicianship, their creative arranging skills. Um, and they were meeting virtually. They were uploading videos and uh, and recordings online, and then collaborating that way. So I was also teaching them how to play all of these instruments, which is uh, a significant part of uh, this class that I was teaching. And then it spilled over in even our doctoral students. We were making uh, videos together, collaborating online, so uploading parts 
and then uh, working with the group to, to uh, creatively arrange. Um, and here's uh, another student group uh, working up a cover of a song and uh, of course waiting. You upload your video and you upload your audio track and then you're waiting for the next person, uh, the, the first courageous person to upload their part and then everyone who follows then is uh, tailoring their part creatively to come up with a product that they're all happy with. So. Um, and so here you can see my classroom. This is a, a, a class of master students. And uh, around the room, there are stations that have headphone hubs where students can jam and play and perform, work on uh, creative arrangements together. Um, they, we practice uh, music teacher as music producer. And so you can see the student on the floor who's mixing uh, the performance of, of uh, the band. And uh, you know, much like a music producer would in a music, in a music studio, and so uh, they were getting ready for a performance that Thursday night at a local coffee shop. And so um, I like to bring in student bands for, uh, as examples. And so I write songs with this particular band. My, my two sons are in this one. And so we talk about the songwriting process and what gives us inspiration and how we come up with lyrics and how we uh, you know, find a groove that fits uh, the, the timbre and the tone of a piece. And uh, so I think the best, some of the best examples of this, and I like to think globally because there are things that um, people are doing around, around the world that we can learn uh, from each other. And uh, one of the best places that I found, uh, at least as of right now, is New Zealand. Um, and so this is Auckland, New Zealand, uh, uh, three classrooms, uh, three music teachers that serve as uh, music producers for their students. They... Um, they facilitate and coach original songs. They ha they record them. Um, they prepare them for performances, live performances around the community. And so uh, here's a classroom, um, a teacher in the upper left-hand corner, and her students are, they had just performed the night before in Auckland, so they're kind of tired. They knew that this professor from Florida is coming in, and so they're kind of ready for that, uh, but also fixing things that were damaged the night before. And um, you can see the, the facility um, is the picture that I've got in the lower right-hand corner of the screen right now is, a, is the layout of her classroom. So it's two classrooms. In the middle is a row of practice rooms. And so in, in the actual teacher space, there's someone recording. Um, and you'll see in a moment that the girl with the ukulele is recording an original song. The band is, uh, there's a band rehearsing out loud in this other space. And so facility um, is a big deal when we think about creative identity, creative musicianship, and how are you going to have a whole bunch of people that utilize um, spaces that we have available. In, in North America, it's primarily band choir and orchestra rooms with practice rooms. So how do you lay all that out so that it works? So this teacher has, uh, has given us an example of that in practice that works really well. So um, she's recording someone, another student is in there recording, doing the video editing, um, audio editing. So here's a, another classroom in Brisbane, Australia. I would say similarly poised for lots of small ensembles that are most of the kids in the school. It's a good baseline uh, way to think about how do we educate all of our students um, for a musicianship that can continue in the future. So they do this very well. Um, and so studio spaces intermingled with uh, rehearsal spaces. So the idea, Matt Tebow's idea of recording arts, the rise of recording arts, certainly is on display um, in Australia. So it's exciting to see. So at this time, I'm hoping that you have questions, some things that we can talk about. Um, Leonard Tan is at Nanyang uh, Technological University in Singapore, my colleague on the study. Um, a significant part of the study. So our talks about how um, Singapore has this cool and interesting uh, contemporary component to their more traditional large ensemble offerings is what started this. Uh, because I was doing a study with a colleague in England, uh, starting a study with a colleague in Finland, and um, Leonard said, you know, we've got this really interesting, cool thing going on in Singapore, and I bet you might find some things to talk about there as well. So um, at this time, I'd like to thank you so much for listening, and I hope that I wasn't too, too
too boring uh, during this, and I hope to field your questions now. Thank you so much.